Here's an idea. Undertale could be one of the most violent games to come out in the last year. Today, we are going to talk about Undertale, a crazy successful and much beloved recent RPG developed and released by indie developer Toby Fox. For those of you who don't know, the basic premise is that you are a small child trapped in an underground monster kingdom, and in the process of escaping, you must, as is generally the case in RPGs, fight monsters. In Undertale, however, as is not generally the case in RPGs, you don't have to kill or even harm those monsters to progress through the game. In the game's verbiage, you're able to show them mercy. Or not. The game's outcome depends primarily on how dedicated you are to sparing or killing the various creatures that you encounter. So what I'm curious about is how Undertale treats violence as a game mechanic and thus distinguishes itself as a unique game, which I think it's very fair to say it does. The way Undertale treats violence has made me question my reflexes going into other video games. In certainly not all, but countless other games, you, the player, are dropped into a situation where you must defeat, often by shooting, an aggressor. And I wonder if this has become my reflexive attitude when playing a new game to shoot the aggressor, is it also a reflexive attitude in making games? And if so, does that mean that those games are stuck? That development-wise, mechanics-wise, there's some kind of roadblock on innovation highway because of an expectation or assumption that players will or must engage in violence directed at opponents. To talk about this, we have to be extra clear about two things. First, what games are we talking about? Mike, you're saying there are scads of nonviolent games. Katamari, Forza, The Sims, Candy Crush Saga, and to this I will say, yes, you are right. But the games that I want to talk about are maybe the ones that are labeled AAA. But even that label is murky. Is a AAA game made or distributed by certain companies? Does it have a certain budget or deal with specific subject matter? Well then, which companies? What budget? And what subject matter? And how fuzzy is the line that determines those? Things. The AAA genre is complicated because the best way to pin it down is by comparing games to games. AAA games look like AAA games. What does a AAA game look like? It looks like these other AAA games. So what I can say is this. There's often a discussion of whether things like Katamari or The Sims count as video games or even games, given their respective platforms, win-lose conditions, skill requirements, or lack thereof. Mostly, games with the AAA designation count the most strongly as both video games and good video games. So that's why I want to talk about them. And in comparison to Undertale specifically, because one need only see the response to Undertale's winning GameFAQ's Best Game Ever 2015 bracket to see that there is some tension here. I might say that what we're talking about isn't violent video games so much as the degree to which certain video games, and as Jamin points out on Game Show, games in general support and respond to violent actions by their players, and even sometimes enact violence on them. Before on Idea Channel, we've defined violence as the potentially aggressive removal of an actor's choice in a situation. Actual physical violence is a subset of this, but since it doesn't really come into gameplay unless we're talking about, like, football, either American or actual, what we're talking about is occasionally metaphorical narrative violence. One game piece harms another and structural violence, the inability for game pieces, and players for that matter, to choose to do something besides harm other game pieces. In other words, narrative violence is harm caused to some set of on-screen pixels, whereas structural violence is the set of walls and borders keeping you on rails, not having the option to say what you mean in a dialogue tree, not being able to get through a game without killing or maiming someone if you would prefer not to. I also want to be super clear that we are about to get critical of violence, but not because it's destroying the moral fabric of society. 
I'm not about to argue that just Medal of Duty Cos Far Calling Cry 4 Modern Borderlands is minting literal killers. As Dan points out on Extra Credits, the very foundation of the Western tradition is built on work which depicts and questions the place of violence in functioning society. In the same way the Odyssey did not turn people into killers, neither do video games, and here are some studies if you want to read. But I do think it's worth asking if we want games to be that perfect mix of easy to play, exciting, cinematic, and realistic, why have we ultimately decided that shooting at things is the way that we want to do that? Chris Franklin, aka Campster, aka Errant Signal, talks about video games as spatial simulations. One plays a form in space taking actions. And though we've learned that this type of simulation can depict basically anything, Chris talks about how it's actually a rather limited system when it comes to doing stuff. Maybe we shoot from behind the gun, maybe we watch from above. Maybe it's spells or pew pews, or maybe it's not shooting but bopping, whacking, or capturing. However it's done, our current popular gaming tradition has determined that this is our analog for progress. There's a threat which is active. We need a way to deactivate the threat to move beyond it to the next threat. This is why games which allow pacifist runs, where no threats are deactivated via death, are rare and, depending upon your tastes, interesting. Mirror's Edge, the Metal Gear games, sorta. Sometimes. Fallout 3, unless you count the roach that you have to shoot with a BB gun, Dishonored, Thief, and a very few others. Often getting to the end of a game without resorting to violence is a feat of skill comparable to speedruns or absurd difficulty settings. Because remember, one, though you can do it doesn't mean that the game encourages you to, and two, often games even discourage you. This is arguably why Undertale's decision to not only support, but encourage and have the game respond to a pacifist run is such a big deal. In the game, one confronts monsters by playing a small arcade-style bullet hell game which then unlocks options for fight, act, item, or mercy. The right string of actions, which can include expressing empathy to your aggressor or sometimes just waiting, will provide the mercy option. You earn some gold, maybe, but no XP, and everyone goes on their merry, living, breathing way. Overall, Undertale asks some easily stated but nearly impossible to answer questions. Like, is the world created differently when we act differently in it? When we change the course of things by taking actions, what happens to the possible worlds described by the actions we didn't take? How actively do we shape our world and its future? Within most game worlds, for all their technological capability, we as players effect staggeringly little appreciable change within them. The choices made are illusory. Decisions can be made, but you're really only ever headed to one place, maybe one or two different places, or different colored explosions. Often, this is an effect of the fact that, in a much grander sense, many games provide players with zero choice in how to act within their worlds. Player is hero, opponents are other, defeat the other. Narrative violence set within structural violence. So far, one solution to the problem of shaping the gaming world is to allow players to wander around off the rails inside of it. But as Patricia Hernandez points out talking about Fallout 4, such open world games still miss the mark if the game assumes that all you're ever going to want to do is fight. Which often, if not mostly, they do because, I mean, see all of the reasons we've been talking about. A world may be relatively open, but the set of actions and attitudes towards situations and NPCs remains restricted. This hamster maze may be huge and brightly colored, but it's still just a Sisyphean Mobius strip of tubes and sawdust. Undertale foregoes an open world for a more classically linear experience. But even so, there's a sense that you're choosing between paths, and each path will have consequences. That the world of the game will be actually meaningfully different because of them. Each encounter, battle, or otherwise is a choice, a real one, to reaffirm your commitment or to start down a new path and thus create a new world. For all of the restriction that it places on movement in space, Undertale, to me, still feels like a more open game than, say, 
Witcher 3, or Fallout 4. Undertale may exhibit a fair amount of structural violence where the world map is concerned, but it doesn't force the player's hand in navigating combat or NPC interaction. Its structural violence is not used in service of narrative violence. I'm not like, hoy, violence shouldn't ever be an option for responding to in-game threats, but rather that if it's not the only option, certain games may become more interesting, both mechanically and narratively. Would a gunless Borderlands make sense? Probably not. But would I play a version of Mass Effect completable entirely via resource mining, space travel, and diplomacy? Hell, yes I would, Chancellor. I hope the Council will forgive my outburst. Undertale, as a game, is great. It's fun to play, pacifist or genocide run, whichever you choose. It's just that the pacifist run may cause one to notice a conspicuous absence in other video games. The ability to have varied interactions with NPCs and the situations that we find them in. The ability to have a meaningful impact on a narrative which is considered set in stone, hard-coded, so to speak. Undertale's narrative is not, or at least it plays as though it's not. So that when one engages in violence in Undertale, it's more meaningful, perhaps more violent, for the simple fact that it is a choice. When one kills, the player does so knowing full well and having been encouraged in not subtle ways that they need not in order to progress. Narrative violence, in the absence of structural violence, requiring it. Which is perhaps exactly what you're after, raining your vengeance upon the monster world. Is that bad? No. Games, like all other forms of media, are about affect, and they always will be. Violence delivers that in fistfuls. I'm simply curious about the other possible worlds where our choices didn't lead to a gaming tradition that links narrative and structural violence so mercilessly. What do you guys think? Can you see how Undertale is maybe one of the more violent games to come out in the last year? Except it's not really the game itself, it's more like how it allows itself to be played. And can you imagine a gaming tradition that doesn't link narrative and structural violence so intimately and popularly? And if so, what does it look like? Let us know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding Area 51 and the belief in aliens. If you wanna watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. This week's episode is brought to you by the hard work of these merciful wanderers. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the doobly-doo. And the tweet of the week comes from Sam Backus, who was answering a question that I asked on Twitter about how best to understand sneaker culture, which is a thing that I know regrettably little about and am really interested in. Uh, and Sam sent me towards a Planet Money podcast about the secondary market for Nike shoes, blowing my mind. Super interesting. Wow.